Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Ann Boyle, Senior Developmental Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Simplified Methods for Investigating Deregulation of the Cell Cycle and Apoptosis in Cancer Progression and the Implications for Anti-Cancer Therapies. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and EMD Millipore. EMD Millipore is the Life Sciences Division of Merck KGAA of Germany and supports cancer researchers with a wide range of reagents for cellular analysis and flow cytometry platforms for all budgets and expertise levels. The company is excited to utilize its expertise in flow cytometry to simplify and advance research in this field. Current Protocols has been in continuous publication for 28 years and is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 17,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your question will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides and a certificate of attendance. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Kai Stober is Vice President of Global Innovation at Shinogi Europe and is an expert in cancer cell cycles and biomarkers. Dr. Stober received his Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of Bonn and his PhD from the University of Cambridge. His PhD studies in the laboratory of Ron Lasky showed that dysregulation of the DNA replication initiation machinery is a major early event in the genesis of cancer. From 2002 through 2014, Dr. Stober was co-principal investigator of the Chromosomal Replication Group at University College London. His work there with Gareth Williams led to a new cell cycle biomarker algorithm that identifies cell cycle kinetics in dynamic tumor cell populations and predicts response to cell cycle phase-directed chemotherapeutic agents and selected targeted therapies. Dr. Stober joined the Japanese pharmaceutical company Shinogi in 2014, where he identifies and evaluates new technologies and targets of therapeutic interest. Dr. Camilla Tiagarashin is a senior R&D manager at EMD Millipore, where she leads a team responsible for applications development on multiple Guava EasySite cytometric platforms. Dr. Tiagarashin has extensive experience with fluorescence-based probes and technologies, as well as with the development of cell and blood-based cytometric solutions. Prior to her work on Guava EasySite platforms, Dr. Tiagarajan worked at Lynx Therapeutics, developing novel fluorescence-based technologies for proteomics. So let's get started with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Stober. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boyle. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today, and welcome to everyone in today's webinar. The first slide shows how receptors in the cell surface for growth factors, survival factors, cytokines, uh, as well as integrins and e coterins which sh um, uh, signal to the cell attachment to the extracellular matrix and to neighboring cells, trigger a multitude of complex branched and partially redundant signal transduction pathways, which lead to the expression of transcription factors that drive uh, the expression of gene batteries that propel the cell cycle and, and allow the cell to proliferate. We can also see how anti-growth anti factors such as TGF-beta signal through alternative pathways and can actually break, put brakes on cell cycle progression and cell proliferation. Cells can also um, sense uh, internal DNA damage, so P53, and external death factors that trigger yet other signaling pathways that can result in programmed cell death or apoptosis. And as you can see, shown in red, are genes that are frequently mutated 
in tumor cells, and you can see that these mutations occur at all levels of the growth-promoting signaling pathways, as well as antimitogenic and as well as cell death-inducing pathways. Um, we, there is currently a change ongoing in the oncology space in the sense that molecular profiling of gene expression and DNA copy number changes allows us to understand the patterns of genomic aberrations in tumors. Um, our discoveries of microRNAs and epigenetic modification by promoter methylation has shown us an additional layer of autotranscription and translational silencing in tumors. The advent of massively parallel sequencing for whole genome analysis has illustrated and shown to us the bewildering complexity of gene mutations in tumors, and we can use RNA interference screening to understand the relevance of each gene to tumor phenotype. And all of this, of course, is occurring in an underlying background of tumor genomic instability. This, uh, uh, these technologically advances are gradually leading to a therapeutic approach that is now guided by the molecular classification of tumors and predictive models of drug response. Having said that, if we focus on uh, gene expression profiling technologies, uh, this, does, this approach doesn't come without um, challenges and potential pitfalls. So if we want to use uh, gene signatures for the prediction of clinical outcome, we have to be aware of the published, many of the published studies are derived from small and clinically heterogeneous patient cohorts. And often we find that the test and validation sets are from the same cohort, and there's always a danger for biased predictive models, and frequently we see a lack of independent validation. We have to be aware and overcome potential sampling error, as RNA and DNA are typically extracted unselectively, and the gene signatures that are being published need to be tested in prospective studies to be adapted into routine clinical use. We want to use um, gene signatures for the prediction of response to a particular therapy, we need to be aware that resistance can be unrelated to the tumor cell. We can be dealing with low sensitivity or cross-hybridization on oligomicroarrays. Often, gene signatures are derived from cancer cell lines, which do not necessarily faithfully reflect tumors in patients. And, of course, the drug target can be downregulated entirely post-transcriptionally, which wouldn't be picked up by this technology. And we are increasingly aware that tumors are functionally heterogeneous, so often resistance to a therapy can come from a very small subpopulation of tumor cells that might not be detected with this technology. Therefore, um, molecular diagnostics and genome-wide analyses um, for the use of prognosis and prediction of response to therapy has not yet found its way into routine clinical practice, and there will be some time uh, to pass until these technologies have matured enough to be integrated into routine uh, clinical practice. Some time ago, uh, we actually proposed an alternative approach, um, which we always illustrate with the tree principle, where you see uh, growth factor receptors um, at the twigs of the tree in the periphery, and you can see the peripheral branches of the tree illustrating the complex and branched and partially redundant nature of oncogenic signaling cascades. We, as we move closer to the trunk of the tree, we arrive at the transcription factors, and the hypothesis that we formulated some time ago is that all of these oncogenic signaling pathways actually converge uh, at the cell cycle engine and uh, more closely within the cell cycle engine at the machinery required to initiate DNA replication. And we postulated that um, diagnostic and therapeutic targeting um, at this level, at this convergence point of the complexity that we see at the periphery might be beneficial for cancer diagnostics and therapy. Um, in this webinar today, I will be um, talking about DNA replication initiation proteins in tissue maintenance and cancer. I will be making a case for some of these proteins as biomarkers for cancer detection, for prognosis, and for prediction of response to cell cycle targeted therapeutics. I will also be making a case that uh, some of these biomarkers can be used for patient stratification for oncology drug trials, and I will go one step further and make a case for the replication initiation machinery as a potential new molecular target for cancer therapy. So starting with um, the protagonists of the webinar today, the DNA replication initiation machinery. As cells exit mitosis and get into early gap phase one of the cell cycle, um, there are approximately 20 to 30,000 sites 
spread along the chromosomes of each cell that can serve as a potential origin of replication. At this point, the origin recognition complex is bound to the potential origins and recruits two loading factors that we call CDC6 and CDT1, and these loading factors recruit the hexameric MCM2-7 to complex. Uh, the assembly of this complex is considered a license to replicate, and we are now sort of getting deeper into G1 phase. As soon as the um, MCM complex is, is loaded, uh, the loading factors are no longer required, and as the cell moves through G1 phase and closer to the G1S boundary, the activity to, of two cyclin uh, of two kinase complexes are required, the cyclin CDK, the global gatekeepers of the cell cycle transition, as well as the CDC7 kinase coupled to its regulatory subunit, uh, ASK. Um, phosphorylation events trigger a conformational change in the MCM2-7 complex, which triggers a helicase activity of this complex, results in the um, partial opening of the DNA helix over 8 to 10 base pairs, and recruits an adapter protein called CDC45, which then recruits the uh, replosome, um, or more specifically DNA polymerase alpha primase, which puts down the DNA RNA hybrid, and then the two replication forks are fully established and can move away from the origin. The protein geminin is an endogenous repressor of the replication initiation pathway. It, pre it prevents re-replication during the same cell cycle, and this protein uh, is present in S phase, G2, and M phase to prevent re-replication, and it is absent during gap phase one when these complexes are legitimately formed. Um, we and others have shown some time ago that DNA replication initiation factors are present throughout all phases of the proliferative cell cycle. And as we know, many of the cells in the human body are out of the cycle. They can either be in a quiescent uh, uh, resting stage that is reversible, which we call uh, also G0. And what you see here is a section through liver. The particides are known to be uh, quiescent, resting cells. This is actually a transplantation liver taken from the donor and stained with an antibody against MCM2. And you can see that um, there's perhaps the odd hepatocyte here that has very faint staining for MCM2. The next image will show you the uh, transplantation liver after 48 hours in the donor, and you can actually now see that most of the hepatocytes are expressing the MCM2 replication initiation factor as there uh, takes place some repetitive growth. Another way for cells to exit the cell cycle is terminal differentiation when they gain a function, and you can see here a section through mouse colon, again stained with MCM2 antibody, and you can see that MCM expression is restricted to the tr stem transit amplifying compartment where cell division occurs. And as cells move to the surface and become mucus-secreting goblet cells, you can see some very tight downregulation of the MCM uh, replication initiation factors. And a, f and a third way for cells to exit the cell cycle is to become replicative senescent. The example I'm showing you here is a, a biphasic giant cell tumor of bone where the multinucleate giant cells are believed to be of macrophage origin and they're considered uh, replicative senescent. You see there's no expression of MCM2 and you see the um, stromal mononucleate-like cells, which is actually the tumor part of this biphasic uh, giant cell tumor, are all expressing MCM2. So we can summarize that as cells actively proliferate um, and go through the cell cycle, the, uh, they express uh, the replication initiation protein CDC6 and MCM, uh, and these proteins shuttle on and off the DNA. As cells exit into any of the three out-of-cycle states, they very rapidly and efficiently downregulate these replication initiation proteins, and that is a way of reducing proliferative capacity. Uh, so can we use these biomarkers for cancer detection? The next slide shows uh, sections through cervical stratified epithelium, normal epithelium, a pre-malignant stage, and a carcinoma in situ, a high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And it's stained with an antibody against proliferating cell nuclear antigen, which is an old-fashioned standard uh, proliferation marker. And we can actually see that in the normal epithelium, cells in the basal stem transit amplifying compartment are expressing a PCNA, which is what we would expect, 
and as cells um, progressively have an arrest to the differentiation program in the pre-malignant state, we're seeing that an additional proportion of cell in higher layers is starting to express PCNA, and you can see that PCNA-expressing cells reach the surface in the carcinoma in situ cage. So if we actually stain with MCM5, you can see again in the normal epithelium MCM expression restricted to the stem transit amplifying compartment. If we look at the pre-malignant state, you can see that uh, a greater proportion of cells are now expressing the MCM5 as the differentiation program is disturbed, uh, reaching uh, all the way up to the surface. And when we look in the carcinoma in situ, you can actually see full thickness staining in all of the cells of MCM5. And at this point, the epithelium has lost polarity. You can turn it upside down and it will look exactly the same. This uh, phenomenon is not restricted to the cervical stratified epithelium. It's actually applicable to all epithelial-lined uh, organs. You can actually see here transitional urethelium of the bladder. And in a healthy individual, you can see how MCM expression is restricted, again, to the basal uh, stem transit amplifying compartment. As cells mature and become uh, typically called umbrella cells on the surface, the uh, MCM proteins are downregulated. If we look at a case of a um, well-differentiated transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. Uh, here's a moderately differentiated um, uh, carcinoma, and here we have a poorly differentiated. You can see as we go from well to moderately to poorly, a progressive number of uh, cells positive for MCM5 reaching the surface levels from which they are exfoliated. We can exploit that, um, that uh, um, situation in the sense that in the normal epithelium, as we discussed, expression of these proteins is restricted to the stem transit amplifying compartment. As the cells differentiate, they downregulate the uh, expression of these proteins. Um, during our pre-malignancy, uh, all the way to a carcinoma in situ and an invasive cancer, the differentiation program is progressively disrupted and MCM-positive uh, cells reaching the surface of the epithelium. In some cases, like the bladder urethelium, they get naturally exfoliated and we can collect the cells in urine. Or in the case of the um, cervical epithelium, of course, during the cervical smear test, uh, a uh, um, uh, healthcare nurse practitioner is taking a 360-degree swap of the surface of um, the cervix, and the cells are then either spun onto, onto uh, microscopic slides or smeared in the old-fashioned way and stained with a Papa Nicolai stain. Um, typically, for a patient, you would have approximately half a million cells that you would find on the microscope slide, and a trained cytologist will look for morphologically abnormal cells um, to detect pre-malignancy or malignancy uh, of the cervix. Um, sometimes this can be as little as 300 cells in half a million cells, so it really is like finding a needle in a haystack. But with our MCM antibodies, we can actually very nicely label the pre-malignant and malignant cells in the cervical smear, leading to an immuno-enhanced PUP smear test. Uh, in case of the bladder urethelium, we can see here these um, finger-like papillary tumors growing from the bladder urethelium. Uh, here is a case of a, an, a healthy individual where the MCM-positive cells are not reaching the surface. Here we have the differentiated umbrella cells and are not coming into contact with the urine. Here are isolated cells in urine. So if we uh, collect urine and sediment the cells and analyze them, with an, crack them open and analyze them with an ELISA, we will get a negative signal. Here's the case of a patient with a transitional cell carcinoma, full thickness staining of the MCM proteins, which are now uh, exfoliated into the urine. And we, again, we can take the ELISA and we will measure a positive signal. We and others have exploited this, um, these uh, processes for the development of um, cancer detection tests. One of them I'm showing you here for um, the cervical smear test. This is uh, with Becton Dickinson, led to the development of the Pro-X C reagent, which includes an antibody against MCM. And you can see how this antibody uh, or this Pro-X C reagent can actually detect pre-malignant and malignant cells in cervical smears, reducing the uh, false negative rate. Um, so that was cancer detection. The next question is, can we use these proteins uh, for prognostic and predictive assessment? of cancer patients, and the example I would like to choose here is the identification of chemotherapy-sensitive breast cancer patients. Um, as I'm sure you all know, breast cancer survivors live with uncertainties of recurrent cancer and some risk for complications from treatment. 
Primary breast cancer patients are commonly treated with chemotherapy and hormonal therapy to reduce the risk of recurrence. The chemotherapy is usually reserved for patients at high risk, but we know that many of these patients do not actually benefit from the chemotherapy despite its known side effects. Each patient's cancer has a different combination of factors that is considered during the prognostic and predictive assessment. And the main prognostic factors in breast cancer are tumor size and shape, the rate of cell division, as well as the hormonal receptor and HER2 receptor status. The, this is shown in the next slide where we see a mammogram showing an abnormality, which can be a luminal or ductal um, uh, cancer of the breast. It could also be a pre-malignant DCIS stage. Um, a biopsy is taken. The pathologist will determine the type of breast cancer, and one of the most important prognostic factors is whether tumor cells have spread to the axillary lymph nodes. The Nottingham Prognostic Index is a surrogate outcome measure that combines the prognostic factors of tumor size, lymph node stage, and tumor grade of differentiation. And uh, as you can see, a low score on the Nottingham Prognostic Index um, correlates with a uh, high overall survival at 15 years, whereas a high NPI score shows a dramatic reduction in overall survival at 15 years. So um, we are targeting chemotherapy to these high-risk patients. However, a low uh, NPI score, um, these patients are unlikely to benefit from chemotherapy. And patients with an intermediate score, we really don't know in advance well enough which patient is likely to benefit from chemotherapy and which patient will only experience the side effects. Um, the patient and the oncologist can use uh, online uh, decision-making tools such as adjuvant online. Here we have a case of a hormone receptor, hormone receptor positive tumor that is poorly differentiated with one to three lymph nodes involved. If the tumor is removed by surgery and there is no additional therapy after 10 years, 53 out of 100 uh, women with this type of tumor will be alive. If um, hormonal therapy is added in addition to surgery and another, uh, an additional 11 women will be alive after 10 years, if chemotherapy is added after surgery, an additional 12 women will be alive after 10 years. And if hormonal therapy and chemotherapy are combined, an additional 21 women will be alive after 10 years. But again, which of these patients will benefit from the treatment, from the chemotherapy treatment, and which patients will not, um, is very difficult to tell. Gene expression profiling tests. Um, are helping us in making this important decision. Um, they examine genes and tumor tissue for the likelihood of recurrence to identify high-risk patients. They help us to determine whether additional chemotherapy should be given. Currently, they incur very high costs. They are not routinely applied, and they involve complex technologies. And importantly, in the case of breast cancer, they are restricted to certain types of breast cancer, namely hormone receptor positive um, uh, lymph node negative patients. Um, despite these recent advances, the statistics tell, sh still tell us that half of patients who receive local regional treatment, that is surgery, or removal of lymph nodes, maybe radiotherapy, will never relapse, whereas the reminder will die of metastatic disease. One third of patients who are node negative, that's a good prognosis, will experience relapse. And one third of node positive patients, which is a not so good prognosis, and who are not receiving additional therapy will be disease-free after 10 years. So there remains a very high need for more accurate prognostic factors in breast cancer and for tests that can allow us to identify patients who are likely to benefit from chemotherapy. Back to our cell cycle proteins, we already discussed that the MCM replication initiation factors are present in all four phases of the cell cycle, but are very efficiently and rapidly downregulated in out-of-cycle states, namely quiescence, differentiation, and also replicative senescence, which is not shown here. We've also mentioned the endogenous repressor of replication initiation geminin, which is present in S, G2, and M phase. And I'd like to introduce another protein histone H3. This protein becomes phosphorylated at serine 10 right on entry into mitosis, uh, mitosis and this phosphate group is um, removed and exit from mitosis. So this is actually a very good marker for cells in mitosis. And some time ago, we actually formulated the hypothesis that multi-parameter analysis of MCM2 geminin and phosphohistone can actually allow us to um, 
do a cell cycle phase analysis in dynamic and complex tumor cell populations and will allow us to identify those patients um, to whom we should target chemotherapy. Um, I'd like to illustrate this with uh, two breast cancer cases. Both of them are invasive breast cancers. The first case, you can actually see that most of the breast cancer cells in invasive tumor, invasive primary breast cancer, are positive for MCM2. You can actually see that a very small proportion are expressing a gold standard proliferation marker, key 67, and an even smaller um, population are expressing the SG2M marker, geminin. And if we look at the uh, phosphohistone expression, you can see that there is hardly a cell in mitosis. So we would characterize this tumor as a tumor that is in cycle, that is replication competent, but that is uh, in an indulate type tumor, and the majority or um, predominantly the tumor cells are not progressing through SG2M phase, and therefore unlikely to benefit from cell cycle targeted chemotherapy. And if you compare this case with the second tumor, which again is an invasive breast cancer, you can see all of the cells are expressing MCM2 in this cancer. Um, the same, almost the same proportion of cells are positive for key 67 A large number of cells are progressing through SG2M, and we are starting to see cells in mitosis. So we would argue that cell cycle targeted chemotherapy affecting replicating and dividing cells should be targeted to this tumor and not to the former example. Based on these findings, we developed a cell cycle algorithm that is applicable to tumor biopsy material. Uh, it is a simple immunohistochemical, immunohistochemical test that can be applied to formalin fixed and paraffin wax embedded tissue samples. And we start by looking for the MCM labeling index. If the MCM labeling index is low and if the geminin and HC labeling indices are also low, we consider this an out of cycle phenotype 1 tumor, which is an indulin tumor composed predominantly of out-of-cycle cells. If the MCM labeling index is high, and if the geminin and HC labeling indices are also high, we're talking about an actively cycling phenotype 3 tumor. And if the MCM labeling index is high, but the uh, geminin and H3 labeling indices are low, we're talking about a tumor that is in cycle, but that is G1 arrested or delayed, is not progressing through SG2M phase. If we look at the prognosis, the prognosis for patients that harbor a tumor that is a phenotype 1, it's a good prognosis. 90% of these patients are alive after five years. If we look at the actively cycling phenotype 3 tumors, um, then this is, this is a poor prognosis. 56% of these patients are alive after five years. And if we look at the uh, phenotype uh, uh, 2, uh, G1-arrested delayed tumors, it's also a good prognosis, almost as good as the out-of-cycle tumors. 89% uh, of these patients are alive after five years. And we would argue that standard cell cycle-targeted chemotherapy should be assigned to patients with phenotype 3 tumors that are actively uh, progressing through the cell cycle. Um, if we look at the Kaplan-Meier curve and we look at the risk of relapse over time, you can actually see how Patients with um, actively cycling phenotype 3 tumors have a much higher risk of relapse compared to the phenotype 1 or 2 tumors. And again, as I said, we would target chemotherapy to this patient group with phenotype 3 tumors. If we compare cell cycle phenotype with molecular subtypes of breast cancer, then you can see that the proportion of um, actively cycling aggressive phenotype two, two, 3 uh, correction phenotype 3 tumors increases between the luminal subtype and the more aggressive HER2 and triple negative subtypes. So this is entirely consistent with our understanding of the biology of these tumors. We conducted uh, some cell cycle phenotyping from patients uh, from a London hospital, and we discovered that in phenotype 3 patients, actively cycling tumors Nearly half of these patients did not receive adjuvant chemotherapy, and we would argue that these patients would have benefited from additional chemotherapy. And if we look at phenotype 1 and 2 tumors, out-of-cycle and G1-arrested delayed tumors, uh, a quarter of patients received adjuvant chemotherapy, and we would be arguing with minimal benefit and most uh, or possibly suffering from uh, the chemotherapy-assigned uh, side effects. So really we can say that it appears that currently Breast cancer patients are over and under treatment, under treated um, because we, of the lack of predictive tests. And this very simple immunohistochemical test 
uh, we are arguing uh, could be used to um, uh, target chemotherapy to the right um, patients. Um, this test is commercially developed at present, and we hope that it will be introduced in the clinic uh, in the near future. Moving to uh, the question whether we can use uh, the cell cycle biomarkers for patient stratification for oncology drug trials. Um, this slide is just to remind us that standard um, cell cycle targeted chemotherapy such as PIVFU is either hitting cells that are actively replicating their DNA or in case of Taxol or mitotic spindle blocker are actually hitting cells that are progressing through mitosis and that cells which are at rest are much less likely to be damaged by chemotherapy. The next slide shows us a table with uh, standard currently used chemotherapeutic agents, and I'm showing you this to illustrate that they really do uh, either target replicating cells or cells that are undergoing um, mitosis. Now, this test is not only good um, and suited to a predict response to cell cycle targeted chemotherapy, such as the two examples we just looked at, but we would also argue that the test is. Uh, um, can be used as clinical utility to predict response to targeted agents such as antibodies or small molecule inhibitors uh, targeting de uh, deregulated uh, growth factor receptors such as EGFR or small molecule inhibitors target as the RAF signaling kinase or PI3 uh, kinase. Um, so we would argue that there is a real opportunity to test for cell cycle phenotype before therapy is assigned and we would um, target cell cycle targeted chemotherapy or targeted agents for growth signaling pathways to phenotype three tumors that are actively cycling, and we would reserve alternative therapies for phenotype one and two tumors, which are either out of cycle, or predominantly out of cycle, or uh, G1 delayed arrested. This very simple immunohistochemistry test can be used as an adjunct test to tumor sequencing and tailored companion diagnostic tests. So to stay with the example of the a deregulated EGFR receptor, you could actually test for an activating mutation in EGFR, and you can uh, do the cell cycle test, and if you find the mutation and you get a signal that this is a tumor uh, composed predominantly of actively cycling cells, then the patient would be eligible for the treatment with a new targeted therapy for a mutated uh, EGFR receptor. This test is also very useful for retrospective testing of discontinued drug candidates that have, been, um, that have been trialed on an unstratified patient population and that showed little efficacy. So we could go back to the um, uh, biopsy tumor tissue from discontinued trials and we could retrospectively do a cell cycle phenotype analysis and we may find that discontinued and shelved drug candidates were actually efficacious in patients harboring phenotype 3 tumors. So we could rejuvenate discontinued uh, uh, drug candidates. Finally, um, I would like to make an argument for targeting cell cycle kinases involved in the initiation of DNA replication for cancer therapy, and specifically I would like to uh, make an argument for CDC7 as a new molecular target for cancer therapy. CDC7 is a serine trionine kinase. Um, it is active and complex which is with its regulatory subunit ASK. And as we discussed earlier, it is essential for the initiation of replication by phosphorylating the MCM helicase, but it is also required for stable maintenance of replication forks. If we target CDC7 with small molecule inhibitors, then normal cells have a, a checkpoint which uh, can sense the blocked DNA replication initiation, and this origin activation checkpoint can actually arrest cells in G1 phase before they progress into S phase. Now, in the majority of cancer types that we studied, we found this origin checkpoint, origin activation checkpoint, to be dysregulated. So tumor cells, instead of arresting in G1 phase, are progressing into S phase with a very small number of replication forks that were established. These forks tend to arrest, collapse, induce double strand breaks which results in a chromosomal fragmentation, and these cells try to enter mitosis, go through an aberrant mitosis, and, uh, which is followed by cell death. So CDC7 inhibitors are very selective in killing cancer cells, whilst normal cells are protected by the origin activation checkpoint. Um, 
in collaboration with our funding body, Cancer Research Technology, we developed a small molecule inhibitor of CDC7, and this inhibitor is uh, tested here in an um, orthotopic xenograft uh, tumor model of um, colorectal cancer cell line, colo uh, 205, which uh, subcutaneously grows on the right-hand flank of the animal. And we see here a vehicle-treated um, animal looking at an H&E stained uh, section through the tumor, and you see if you treat the mice with CDC7 inhibitors, we see large areas of cell death occurring in the tumor. Um, and if we look at higher magnification, we show many morphological signs of cell death in the uh, CD7-treated animals. If we look at the uh, mouse colon, we can see that in both the vehicle-treated animals and the CDC7-inhibitor-treated animals, the architecture of the colon is preserved. If we look with an MCM antibody, we see, indeed, MCM-positive cells in the stem transit amplifying compartment, as we have seen before. Um, and if we look with Gemin in the SG2M marker, you can see that in the vehicle-treated animals, the cells maintain the, pos the ability to go through SG2M phase and divide. However, you see in the CDC7-treated animals how very few cells express Geminin, and we would argue that this is because these cells are inducing the origin activation checkpoint and are therefore shielded from this uh, cytotoxic effects of the inhibitor. Um, not surprisingly, there's a large number of um, pharmaceutical uh, and biopharmaceutical companies that are developing um, CDC7 inhibitors that have ongoing CDC7 drug discovery and development programs, and we have to wait for the results from the clinics to see um, how efficacious this new therapy is. I'm coming to the end of the webinar and I'd like to come to the conclusions. The DNA replication initiation and mitotic regulatory proteins function at the convergence point of complex oncogenic signaling networks. The deregulation is central to the aberrant cell proliferation that characterizes all cancers. The expression can be quantified using a very simple and inexpensive immunohistochemical staining of routine processed paraffin embedded material. This test allows us to determine the cell cycle dynamics easily in individual patient samples. We can uh, determine tumor-specific biomarker expression and distinguish it from that present within the background stroma. Uh, this allows us to determine the, cell, the kinetics of cell proliferation and not specific molecules or pathways. Therefore, this technology is applicable to many different cancers. Um, we and others have already shown clinical applications in the detection of cancer in the prognosis and in the prediction of response to cell cycle uh, directed therapy. And I would go one step further and say that the DNA replication initiation machinery is a promising novel molecular target for cancer therapy. Um, it's been a pleasure to summarize the work that has spanned nearly two decades. And I would like to thank um, the friends, collaborators, and members of the chromosomal replication group uh, as well as our funding bodies that have supported this work and the two universities that have supported the research, University College London and the University of Cambridge. And I would like to explicitly thank uh, Dr. Boyle and Dr. Taylor at Current Protocols for the invitation uh, to deliver this webinar today. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening and would like to pass it back to the moderator. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stober, for that very informative talk. Uh, now let's move on to Dr. Tagarajin's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Boyle, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, my name is Kamla Tagarajin, and I'm from EMD Millipore, and I, I also would like to thank the audience for taking the time to attend our webinar today. Um, at EMD Millipore, I lead uh, the development of assays and applications on our flow cytometry platforms. And today, I'll be discussing um, simplified methods to investigate cell cycle and apoptosis in the evaluation of anti-cancer compounds. Um, as we just heard, um, anti-cancer compounds can impact multiple cellular processes in parallel. Uh, they can cause uh, dysregulation of the uh, cell cycle and modulate the process. Um, they can also cause perturbation of the proliferation of tumor cells. They can induce uh, cellular stress 
apoptosis or cytotoxicity in cancer cells or in target cells, or they can inhibit or modify specific key molecular markers, either up or down regulating critical proteins, um, just as we saw in the example of Dr. Stobel's talk on the cell cycle kinase CDC7. So in order to truly understand the mechanism of action of compounds and also research conditions on um, you know, compound use, one needs to comprehensively understand what are the different impacts caused by the compounds, what is the sequence and sensitivity of this, uh, I these impacts. And, and uh, for this, we need to evaluate uh, results from a number of different assays on treatment of cells with these compounds and put together this picked information to obtain a more complete picture of the mode of compound action. So in this webinar, I wanted to present a data from some studies we performed evaluating multiple anti-cancer compounds and studying how these compounds modulated cell cycle or induced apoptosis or cell death in parallel using uh, microcapillary flow cytometry. The compounds which uh, were evaluated in the study included compounds uh, which are some very well-known anti-cancer compounds like etoposide, starosporin, and some newer ones like gambogic acid. As, um, and necrotazoles. Cells were uh, typically treated with compounds at different concentrations, and the impacts evaluated using assays for cell cycle uh, changes and xn 5 based apoptosis and cas based activation. All studies were performed using a highly simple benchtop platform called the MUSE cell analyzer. So let's take a quick look at the MUSE cell analyzer and the kind of information it can provide for such studies. The MUSE cell analyzer is a simple platform for, um, is a, uh, for op obtaining cell health data um, in a, a very small, simple, and friendly interface. Uh, the instrument has a small footprint, and it's based on principles of microcapillary flow cytometry. And this provides advantages in that it can use small sample sizes, which can be very important when we are trying to deal with uh, uh, limited cellular samples. And also, it generates very low biohazardous waste. It's a closed platform, and this means that they are optimized in specific kits for convenient analysis of a multiple uh, series of questions, um, many of which are related to cell death mechanism. Each assay on the platform is paired with an assay-specific uh, software, and the software really makes the interaction of the user with the instrument highly simple. It's a touchscreen-based software which guides the user through multiple steps um, and provides uh, uh, you know, the analytical data in a format which is simple and easy to interpret as shown on the right over here. That's a combination of optimized kits, um, a simple instrument platform, and um, you know, dedicated software output makes it very easy for users to obtain information on uh, cell cycle, uh, apoptosis, or uh, cell cellular stress, and other kinds of questions. So there are about 23 kits available on the MUSE platform, which range uh, from um, questions on cell health, cell signaling, and immunology. Um, these are for research use only and not for use in diagnostic purposes. Um, but the ones of interest to this discussion are the assays for cell health. As you can see in this slide, there are multiple assays available on the MUSE that can address questions related to cell health. Thus, there's uh, assays available to obtain basic count and viability of populations, there's a variety of assays to determine uh, the populations of cells undergoing apoptosis of stress, uh, mitochondrial potential changes, caspase changes, as well as oxidative stress and nitric oxide. And there's also uh, assays which can help determine the distribution of cells in different phases of the cell cycle, which is called the MUSE cell cycle assays. Um, so um, I would now like to go through a few of the assays on the platform that um, will be used in the studies that I described. 
So many anti-tumor compounds result in apoptosis and cytotoxicity, and it's often important to characterize and quantitate cells undergoing apoptosis. And as we all know, apoptosis is characterized by a progressive series of biochemical and morphological changes. And one of the changes is the exposure of phosphatidylserine to the outer membrane surface of a cell. And this externalization is considered a hallmark of apoptosis and is universal to different species and cell types. So the muse annexin 5 and death cell assay is a no-wash assay that allows for the easy identification of cells undergoing early and late apoptosis. The assay provides quantitation based on detection of phosphatidylserine using fluorescently labeled annexin 5 in combination with a dead cell dye called 7AAD. And the fluorescently labeled annexin 5 can positively identify early and late apoptotic cells, as shown in the figure on the right. And 7AAD enters the cells that are compromised and dead or late apoptotic cells. Thus, you can see four populations as shown on the result plots. You can see the live cells. You can see early apoptotic cells, which only show the annexin 5 response. And the upper right, you can see the late apoptotic dead cells and then on the left, upper left, just the dead cells. So the app assay uses a simple mix and read protocol to provide uh, test results, and this can really give you good accuracy and reproducibility when you're doing your experiments, um, uh, with especially with a lot of different treatment conditions. Another assay to characterize apoptosis is the MUSE multi-caspase assay, um, uh, and the activation of caspases is a, cr is a critical event in apoptosis. Uh, caspases are cysteine proteases that play a central role in the propagation of apoptosis, but there's also recently there's been a lot of reports on how caspases can contribute to cell cycle regulation, especially in the mitotic phase. So the MUSE multi-caspase assay is a pan-caspase caspase assay, which can detect multiple caspases, you know, caspase 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 activity. And it uses a fluorescently labeled inhibitor of caspases called FLICA. And, um, and when cells are treated with the uh, PAM caspase reagent and uh, 7AAD, in, again, a no-wash assay, uh, you can see four populations of cells. You can see live cells as shown in the dot plot on your left. Um, you see caspase positive cells, and you can see caspase and positive cells which are dead. So, um, so the dead cells in the 7AD again detects uh, cells with compromised membrane, and thus this assay can provide again uh, information on the presence of any kind of caspase activity um, in the cellular populations under study. So here's an example of how um, you know the caspase assay can be utilized for looking at the impact of an anti-cancer compound, uh, etoposide in this case. Um, as you can see, the, in, uh, the control cells uh, in the first plot only show the live population on treatment uh, with 5 micromolar and 10 micromolar of etoposide, what you see is the emergence of uh, caspase positive population, uh, which now goes up from 1.3 to 32 percent over here, and also some death uh, population, uh, where, uh, which show also caspase uh, activity, which is 38.9 percent, and this increases with um, uh, increased etoposide concentrations of uh, 10 micromolar, and thus, um, you know, this can be utilized to look at information on treatment with uh, different anti-cancer compounds. Um, another assay which is very uh, valuable in uh, evaluating the action of the anti cancer com compounds is the MUSE cell cycle assay. The MUSE cell cycle assay allows for the study of uh, cell cycle disrupting conditions or compounds, and it provides information on the percentage of cells in each phase of the cell cycle. Uh, so, you know, the G0, G1, the S phase, and the G2M phases. Um, and uh, the assay utilizes a, sim a single pre-made cocktail, which includes propidium iodide, which is a fluorescent DNA intercalating dye, which helps to measure the DNA content in single cells. There's also RNAs included in that uh, proprietary reagent that helps to make sure that the interaction is DNA-specific. 
Um, so uh, for the assay prep conditions, after um, you know ethanol fixation of the cells and removal of ethanol, the user adds a cell cycle reagent and is ready to read results in 30 minutes. And obtained distribution data as shown in the plots on your right, for example, for JERCAT and PC3 cells. And uh, again, as we went through with uh, Dr. Stober, as cells progress through the cell cycle, the DNA content of the cells changes, and cells in different phases can be distinguished on basis of the DNA content. So this slide shows you the, an example on the study of treatment of etoposide on cell cycle distribution. And here we have controlled cells, which shows the typical distribution of the JERCAT cells. On treatment with etoposide, what we see is an increase in the population of the G2M population. So you're seeing this transition from the G001 to the G2M, and you are seeing that the cells get arrested in the G2M phase with increasing concentration of etoposide. So going back to our studies, um, you know, let's look at how some of these assays were utilized to uh, uh, study the relationship between cell cycle and apoptotic impact of anti-cancer compounds. And just to remind you, you know, our, um, what we do here is take cells, treat them with different concentration of anti-cancer compounds, um, and in this case, all the treatments were for, for 16 hours. And then the same sample was divided into uh, and analyzed by the MUSE cell cycle assay or the MUSE uh, assay for an XN5 and dead cell and MUSE multicaspase assay. And then the information was put together to get a deeper dive into the uh, parallel impacts of uh, the compound treatment. So in this slide, uh, we show results from the treatment of etoposide and storosporin. The plots in blue on the top uh, show the cell cycle result, and for each treatment conditions, uh, you can see that the, um, the G0, G1, S, and G2M distribution. The plots on the bottom show the impact of the apoptosis assays uh, and the percent positive cells that uh, were detected by the assays uh, for apoptosis. So as we look at this result, um, and if we um, look at the impact of etoposide treatment, we see that um, etoposide, which is a DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, um, and with treatment concentrations, what we see is that um, we see a conversion as we go to 200 to 400 nanometer, uh, nanomolar concentrations, we see an increase in conversion from the uh, G0, G1 to the G2M, so we can see the arrest very nicely. Now, when we look below in the panel below on apoptosis impacts, we see that there's almost no apoptosis uh, going on under these conditions. But in the previous data that I'd shown you, at higher concentrations, you do see, um, you know, significant apoptosis uh, as we continue treatment with etoposide. Uh, but what the data shows us is that the impact on the cell cycle at low concentration is, um, uh, is greater and is much more sensitive to etoposide treatment. If you compare this with starosporin, uh, which is a protein kinase C inhibitor, and the data is shown on the right, what you can see is that with treatment, we, we seem to be seeing parallel impacts on the cell cycle distribution along with apoptosis impacts occurring in parallel. So uh, again, uh, this kind of comparison of uh, concentration and uh, cell cycle and apoptotic impacts um, shows uh, some differences in the mode of action of some of these compounds. So um, another compound that we investigated using this approach is gambogic acid. Gambogic acid is a natural product, uh, product from Chinese herbal medicine, uh, which was, has been in the past few years, uh, you know, found to have uh, potent anti-cancer properties. Um, it is considered to be a mitocan, and recent studies have demonstrated that it can actually target the mitochondria of the cells. And when we uh, do studies with, you know, mitochondrial uh, assays, for example, we can see that there's a pronounced impact on mitochondrial depolarization with gambogic acid. Um, and in this uh, experiment, as we looked at the impact on cell cycle versus apoptosis, um, you can see that on the left, there's not such a significant difference to the cell cycle distribution. However, you can see on the right that there's 
a very significant and um, you know apoptosis that we see when there's low concentrations of gambogic acid with both the annexin and the caspase responses uh, coming up, and also there is very significant death that takes place. And this is also kind of interesting because people have reported that they can see um, different impacts on the cell cycle of, with gambogic acid for different cell lines um, with no impact in some cases and a G2M arrest in some other cases. So certainly, I mean, studies like this need to be extended to multiple cell lines uh, to truly understand the different ways in which the compound can impact uh, both processes. Um, here's another example that we wanted to share where we looked at nocardazole, which is a well-known um, and well-characterized anti-cancer agent. It's a microtubule disrupting agent that can arrest cells in mitosis. And uh, as we look at this data, the cell cycle data on the left, uh, you can see clearly that uh, there is a, a big conversion of the cells um, as we go to the 50 nanogram per ml concentrations. Uh, and you can see the G2M arrest, um, you know, so you are converting the cells into the G2M phase, and they're locked in the uh, G2M phase. Um, and uh, the data on the right shows us that you are also starting to see apoptosis in these cells with this kind of treatment condition and this conversion, so you, uh, which is increasing uh, with the treatment. So in summary, uh, the evaluation of anti-cancer compounds and the cellular effects requires an understanding of how such compounds impact different dimensions of cellular health, such as the ability to cause apoptosis and cell death, as well as how they impact cell cycle. Um, the MuCell Analyzer is a small and powerful platform that can quickly provide information and data on cell cycle distribution and apoptosis or cell stress uh, or death simply and rapidly. And um, uh, the combination of assay-specific kits and guided touchscreen software can really enable uh, uh, a variety of users to be uh, to quickly obtain results on this platform. Um, and there is a wide variety of assays um, that can be utilized uh, to study uh, impacts such as cell stress, cell uh, apoptosis, or death on the platform. And uh, more importantly, you know, the parallel information and understanding of apoptosis with cell cycles distribution can be critical for understanding the linkage between these processes and provide a more complete understanding of mechanism and impact of anti-cancer compounds. With that, um, I would like to go to the next slide. And I would like to acknowledge the nice work done by Kim Van Tran on my group in the study, and also my colleagues, um, Louis Rollins and my supervisor, Jahangir Misri. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, I think that we can squeeze in a quick question and answer segment. So if you haven't yet submitted a question for either representers, now is the time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Okay, uh, let's see what, um, what questions we have so far. Um, all right, here's one. Uh, what are the advantages of assessing cell cycle changes by flow cytometry versus other methods? Um, so I can take that question. Um, uh, so there's um, a lot of advantages in doing cell cycle by flow cytometry. In fact, um, classically, cell cycle analysis has always been done by, um, has mostly been done by flow cytometry. And uh, some of the big advantages are that you can rapidly analyze a large number of cells um, very quickly, and so uh, you get a much more statistically relevant answer. Um, uh, you can look at the difference in fluorescence intensity and, and discriminate between the G0, G1, the G2M, and the um, S phases, uh, you know, more reproducibly. Uh, the methods used um, with flow cytometry are, um, are generally quite simple. And, um, and also the analysis um, in, in the way that, for example, we showed you on the MIO cell analyzer can um, help you um, uh, distinguish and obtain good CVs in the population. So the flow uh, analysis brings a lot of um, advantages uh, to looking at the cell cycle problem. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and, uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have a couple other questions here. Um, here's another. Uh, will the caspase assay work for intrinsic versus extrinsic apoptosis? Um, I can take the question. Um, so uh, there are different caspases which are involved in the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. As we know, the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis uh, occurs through the DET receptors, and the principal caspase, um, initiative caspase in that sequence is caspase 8, which gets activated. And um, once caspase 8 is activated, it can either um, activate subsequent executional caspases, like caspase 3 or 7, or it can actually activate uh, via the intrinsic pathway, uh, um, you know, the mitochondrial depolarization and then caspase 9 and 3, 7 activation. So we have a couple of different assays for the caspase. The multi-caspase assay will work for any of the caspase 8, 9, 3, 7 caspases. Um, we do have a specific caspase 3, 7 assay too. And since it's the executional task base, it would be common to these pathways. So, okay, yes, it would work for both. All right, and here's a, another question uh, What are the key protein targets in cell cycle changers for patient stratification with cancer? Uh, I can take this uh, question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think most agents in, in cancer therapy are uh, cell cycle targeted agents, certainly the chemotherapeutic agents, against cells that are replicating, that are progressing through S phase, or cells that are dividing, that are progressing through mitosis, um, as well as targeted agents against growth factor signaling pathways are uh, converging in the cell cycle. Um, there is a core group of three proteins, MCM2, which identifies cells in all four cell, uh, phases of the cell cycle, and geminin, which is a protein present only in S, G2, and M phase, and finally, phosphohistone H3, which is a protein identifying cells in mitosis. And a very simple immunohistochemistry test can identify the proportion of um, uh, cells in tumors that are actively cycling and can differentiate patients' tumors into out-of-cycle indulin tumors, tumors that have the potential to proliferate, but they are not actively going through the cell cycle, and finally, tumors that are actually uh, consisting of a very high proportion of actively proliferating cycling cells. And it is that final group of patients with actively proliferating tumor that are specifically sensitive to cell cycle-targeted chemotherapy, as well as growth factor signaling-targeted agents. Uh, so this very simple means to chemistry test can stratify patients and identify that uh, group of patients with actively proliferating tumors uh, sensitive to these agents. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there are a couple more questions. I think we can squeeze them in. Uh, here's another. Uh, my understanding is that the graphs, slides with caspase and annexing data in combination were composed from two separate flow assays. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. They are from separate flow assays, but they were all run from the same treatment and, um, and the same cell, cellular population treated with compounds in parallel. Okay. And one final question. Um, is it possible that these explanations can be applied for locally delivered drugs to reachable cancers like oral cancer. Uh, the chemicals deregulating the cell cycle can be delivered locally into the tumor to reduce the sy systemic effects. Mm. Dr. Stober, are you, are you there? I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. Uh, um, unfortunately, that's all I have here. So, uh, well, why don't we why don't we wrap it up then, and perhaps that can be um, answered uh, via mm -hmm. email with with the uh, with the question the person asking the question, because um, we are just about out of time, and I know we went a little bit over. Uh, so let's conclude the question and answer session. Uh, today's webinar has been recorded, and it will be available for viewing in the next few days. 
Uh, we will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar, along with instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. On behalf of today's speakers and our sponsor, EMD Millipour, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's seminar webinar and look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols. Thank you.